Welcome to our podcast. This time we will be talking about a book that probably needs no introduction. Uh, we talk about Nietzsche's Zarathustra, or thus spoke Zarathustra, also sprach Zarathustra. One might think that this is the main work that Nietzsche wrote, and it was certainly um, not his intended main work, but it has become that because Nietzsche, of course, wanted to write the will to power that was supposed to be his magnum opus. But Zarathustra now, because Nietzsche never finished the will to power, has become very much the main doctrine of this great thinker of the late 19th century who saw the problems of modernity probably clearer than anyone else in his century. And he saw very far ahead, which had to do, of course, with his perception of time, which is also something we'll talk about as we we'll go through today. We'll touch on some of the main themes of Zarathustra, one of those being the eternal recurrence of the same. And then, of course, the Übermensch, the either Superman or Overman, depending on your translation of that term. And we'll also talk about the last man who is in stark contrast to the Übermensch. And with me today, again, is Chris, who is my co-host here on this podcast. And Chris has a couple of themes also he wants to talk about in Zarathustra. So what are those themes, Chris? So I think um, it's good. We need to talk about the style of this book, because this is not an ordinary philosophy book uh, by any stretch of the imagination. This is, uh, if you start philosophy reading Plato, Aristotle, um, Locke, Hobbes, um, or, or someone more modern, this is the first thing you recognize is that this um, is, is not like those books. It's It's poetic. It's almost it runs in parables it's a very different style and i think well part of my phd work was looking at the way style the importance of style in in terms of philosophical content and saying that style is not really it's not the way you dress up an argument it, it it's part of your argument so as well as style i think uh, virtue is a really important uh, concept in this book it's you might not think that from from nietzsche and zarathustra he's Nietzsche's a famously iconoclastic writer. He's not someone you'd think of as having much interest in virtue. And, and, and maybe the common conception of this book is that he he tells one to not be virtuous. But I think what he's really he's talking about virtue in an interesting way. Um, so we'll, hopefully we'll get to that. Um, yeah. And all, and also knowledge. Like what what does what what does Nietzsche have to say about knowledge that might be different from someone like Plato or someone with um, a more conceptual understanding of knowledge? And it might be finally, it might be good just to talk about uh, how what what does this book have to say to us today? Is um, Johannes said this book that is kind of it, it's it was it looks to the future. And even when Zarathustra was writing this, he was talking about. Um, that his his proper readers have not appeared yet, but they will. Yes. So he's kind of right. He's more than many philosophies. He's writing into posterity quite consciously. So what does what does this book have to say to us today? Yes, we will talk about that certainly because especially the last men uh, is, is is extremely about what's going on today. Because one of the other main themes of of Nietzsche's philosophy is nihilism, of course. Now. Let's speak uh, a little bit about style. Um, now, Zarathustra is written in um, aphorisms. It's very poetic. But what do you think the reason for that is and how that, what that transports in when we read the text? Yeah, so, well, he's, he's well, we, one thing you have to say is clearly um, the Bible is, is, we need to talk about that the influence of that okay because he's he's kind of mocking the bible um he's but he's also imitating it um and he he's he's he, he writes in parables as you say he writes in this poetic way mm. so he's clearly he's he's in a conversation with with the uh, bible um in a way that really no other no other philosophy book is i think or so this this book is a part of nietzsche's and he just works in all his books. A, a lot of his books are in this style. So he's 
he's responding to that and, and he's t this is a conscious effort to 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 compete with the bible almost yeah that's that's a really yeah. egotistical thing to say but Nietzsche was not shy of his ego um and, and so, yeah, he's not critiquing the Bible from some higher kind of more prosaic um, perspective. He's he's getting right right into it and 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 speaking onto its level. And this is you don't you don't replace another work by kind of critiquing it in in a in a in a dry way. You, you replace it by by replacing it by doing what it does, and that is to talk in parables in in poems. Um, and in this way. Sure. Um, now, the book begins with, and this is one of the themes I want to focus on, is with uh, the, the his initial um, leaving his sort of his 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 cave uh, where he lives with animals and he goes to the city. And it's very interesting that, that in the German it says that thus began Zarathustra's down going or going down, which is right. how it's usually translated, but Untergang means or can mean demise, decay. Um, so there's something Zarathustra has to let himself down, but he has to come down and he speaks with a great love for human being. So and I think, so he, he's not uh, an awful um, you know, misanthrope. He's not the Schopenhauerian pessimist who wishes for all existence not to be in the face of all that's awful and grotesque of, of you know, modernity. Um, there are already, you can already see the destruction of what it means when God dies, right? I mean, we, we must always remember that Nietzsche is the philosopher of nihilism and is the philosopher who doesn't proclaim the death of God, but certainly makes us aware that God has died and that we are not yet aware of it. Mm. And in the uh, the gay signs where where the madman uh, proclaims the death of God, we we learn that this is not a triumph. This is not the human right. being being triumphant over 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 himself or over God. No, it's it's rather it's he he says something to the effect of the, the, we've we've torn down the horizon and. So we we've gotten rid of meeting basically, right? Yeah, he, he the, the death of God is is not is not as you say, Trump. It's almost a lamentation. It's it's what have you yeah. done? <laughs> yes, exactly. It's exactly and, that. And the reason for that is 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 that the the asceticism which came with, um, with with the mora with Christian morality is as, as bad as it is, and as much as Nietzsche thinks it needs to be replaced, it was also the thing that. That gave man his power to do all the great things that he did. Yes, um, in terms like art or like um, so, religious overcoming is is good insofar as it's overcoming. But Nietzsche thinks it's 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 an ascetic overcoming, and and, and yes. um, it needs to be better. But at least it was an overcoming. And by yeah. <laughs> by killing God, they have the people have killed that which allowed them to to to, to do these extraordinary things. And this is also why today in English, you, people tend to translate Übermensch no longer as Superman, but as the Overman. That yeah. means as the, the man who goes over and beyond himself. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the man is something that must be overcome is, is a quote that, that recurs throughout the book. But the question is, of course, you know, what is meant by that? Because this could, this could, this opens the the gate to hell, basically. When you, because that 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 could invite transhumanists saying, yes, we need to overcome the human being. I think what Nietzsche means, though, is um, is a, a, a specific way of being human that is mm -hmm. that that's entrenched in a certain morality that. Uh, stifles human creativity, and and that's not necessarily just Christian because what he calls the last man uh, is the perfect consumerist. Mm -hmm. Is a perfect consumer consuming. You could he's like a, a a man who who lives for consumption um, and has no greater goal beyond himself other than enjoying the small pleasures and this is why he calls yeah yeah no sorry go on 
Now, this is why he calls the last man. He says, you know, the last man lives longest and that the last man is uh, sort of... Um, you know, he. This is in the, the prelude. I sh- he, Zarathustra says, I show you the last man. And then he quotes him. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man and blinks. The earth has then become small and on it there hops the last man who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable like that of the ground flea. So yeah. it's he's he's quite, I mean, but what he's saying here is that this is someone who doesn't long for anything. This is someone who doesn't want to create. This is someone who doesn't know a true love and affection for something or someone and who doesn't long for the stars. Yeah, this is someone and, who is on the level of the of the ground. Sorry. No, no, you're right. And uh, and cultural relativism is is a kind of is a big thing here as as well, isn't it? Yeah. So that there's not it really. There's there's no there is no no good and evil for 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 the last man. It's 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 present. Everything is is present, and everything is yeah. Everything is kind of beyond those values that the traditional morality has given us and that something like the Zarathustra's morality uh, wants to give us as well. Yes, and there is, I mean, there's certainly no virtue uh, here. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting that Francis Fukuyama's book on the end of history, which mm. is a very pseudo-Hegelian account of, of history, uh, which was written, of course, in the early 90s after the end of the the demise of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Francis Fukuyama published this now you know infamous book on how history had supposedly ended, and when and, th- and that me- meant for him that the entire planet will now become one, united under a liberal democracy. You know, you could call that neoliberalism if you like. So everything would be quite homogenous. Everything would be quite sterile and the same, but he celebrated that. And the subtitle of that book, believe it or not, is The Last Man. <laughs> yeah. So he yeah. was very aware of that liberal democracy is of the last man. It is a, a meaningless, ongoing drivel that, 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 that goes absolutely nowhere. It has no goal beyond itself. And that's something Nietzsche, I think, warns against right so that's that's a kind of a new asce- asceticism you could almost say isn't it yeah th- that's right and, and and the other thing that i think the liberalism uh, connection with with nietzsche is is another thing that another another theme of of this book is hierarchy isn't it yes uh, yeah you can't really talk about nietzsche without that and that is i mean we, we were talking about um uh, Marx aurelius last last time and I think all all those all those early philosophers, this is all their philosophies were philosophies that really anyone could practice. I mean, um, as I, as we said, Marcus Aurelius was an emperor. The other great Stoic philosopher is Epictetus, who was a slave. Um, I think Plato, as much as well, maybe we're wrong with Plato because he divided uh, his Republic up quite quite starkly. But no one would. Um, I don't think anyone would quibble with, it, with with these philosophies being somehow um, universal, right? These these are precepts that anyone can follow. For Nietzsche, that that's that's not the case. This is really stark. He talks about um, he talks about as coming to virtues. He talks about the petty virtues, doesn't he? And um, mm. it's not that these are these are bad virtues for all people, but these are certainly bad virtues for some people. Yes. And so the the book is a call for human creativity. It's a call um, also to to accept the the fact there is this passage. I don't remember quite where it was, but he meets an old hermit mm. and talks to him, and then he says, "Hasn't it's a shame the old hermit hasn't heard yet that God is dead." Mm. So the message of the book is, God is dead. That's it. And you can either become the last man and really just live uh, for nothing beyond yourself, or you can at least try. You can at least 
become, you know, full, live up to that Faustian ideal almost of the of 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 man, rather than saying this is the end of history. Uh, we've arrived at that one great, beautiful, homogenous shopping mall uh, where everyone can buy the same stuff. I mean, literally, this is something, you know, speaking of, of what we can learn today, uh, there's a few things you want to touch on. But you, you can read these days in, in, you know, major news outlets that, well, look, we're all the same. We're all watching Netflix. We're all watching the same shows on Netflix. Yeah. And so, therefore, there are no differences. There, there is everything's fine as long as we all watch Netflix. And that's so sad it's and, and the coming worst in, thing you could say and as he said you, you said you, you mentioned for Kiara in politics um yeah part of that time then the night the, the the end of the well the 90s going on into the 2000s you had um in america bill clinton in britain tony blair and these were well tony blair modeled himself on on clinton in a lot of ways and they called the tony blair era the third way and yeah. this is this this is a a politics of um you, you could call it pragmatism and compromise but it's really it's neat it's a it's a politics of emptiness isn't it it's neither it's not right it's not conservatism it's not left it's not um it's not progressive uh, socialism either it's 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 the end of history it's the end of politics as well in the sense that these are things we shouldn't really talk about. We should just um, let these bureaucratic managers uh, take care of things for us, and we can just go on uh, consuming our goods and uh, and and enjoying enjoying the the cheap consumables that that globalization brings, and not really think too much about what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's a very bleak uh, picture, and it's it's fascinating because we talked about this before that Nietzsche. Um, he does say in several of his notes as well that I'm writing for readers that, are, that have not been born yet. Yeah. And it's, so he's writing posthumously. Now, of course, you could ask um, the we question. Should say, we should yeah. say that's a feature of his whole career. I mean, his second book was called uh, Untimely Meditation, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So already he's, he knows he's out of time in a way. Yeah, and 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 just to mention that the the second untimely meditation was on the use and abuse of history uh, for life. Yeah, and his preferred way of living historically is the monumental way of of living historically, which means you look back and you look at figures like Napoleon or Goethe, uh, or of course people even including Plato, even though you know officially he doesn't really like him, but people who created. And people who, so for Nietzsche, the story in terms of nihilism is Platonism, that kind of idealism was the greatest bulwark against nihilism ever conceived of. And that's basically also what Christianity is, mm -hmm. because it creates this ideal world and that gives meaning. And Nietzsche doesn't celebrate the fact that maybe that world of ideas has collapsed because that gives us no more meaning. So one of the things he talks about, how do we gain meaning again? is by accepting the eternal recurrence of the same. The eternal recurrence of the same is described by Nietzsche as the heaviest weight, because something he notices about modern man is that we are floating. There is, of course, you know, there's this famous book by Kundera, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. There's a certain lightness about us. We're floating away. There's nothing that pulls us down. And that kind of not, not having gravity is that kind of silly, ironic, distance, detached, cold way of the hipster, right? The, the perfect consumer <laughs> yeah. uh, who's, who's never really interested in anything. You know, there's everything's a fashion, everything's a fate. I mean, that's just the most well, it's, grotesque. It's a, it, it, it's, it's a crime to be interested in something. <laughs> that's irony, isn't it? You have yes, to... I mean, yes, in, in, in the proper sense of the word. You know, everything's very interesting. Nietzsche has this passage in the, in the, in the unpublished um, uh, note, notes where he talks about the, mo the modern European man is indeed very much interested, but only epidermally interested, right? It, it nothing, it, it all, everything touches the skin, but it never goes, it never, it never touches our hearts. And Heidegger points out in, in one of his essays, what interesting or 
interessant in the term what that means. He says, you know, the problem with interesting is that it's all just fleeting by. When you look at what the word means, which is inter esse, that, that's Latin, it means to be with something. Mm. And that means to remain with something. So you have a true passion for it. You're not just following a certain fashion. And actually, because, you know, we've all become Schlegelian uh, ironics, uh, ironists, sorry, uh, so the, the the Schlegel romantic uh, picture by by Friedrich Schlegel, who was a German romanticist, was that all we can do in modernity is to be ironic about everything. Um, this is before Nietzsche, by the way. So he said, we can self-create, but as soon as we've self-created something, we have to self-destruct. That That's the only possible way of being. And he's actually advocating for uh, a vegetative state that we're supposed to be in. Uh, th that's the proper way of being in, in this absurd state of, 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 of modernity. And Nietzsche is trying to, you know, wake us up, I think, in the Zarathustra. So how does, how does the eternal recurrence bring us back to that? Because everything, and I, th I think, you know, this is why it's, so there is a passage in the third part of the book where, um, when Zarathustra is told, then you have to know who you are and who you have to become. You are the teacher of the eternal recurrence. This is now your fate. Now, um, this is but why is it his fate? It's his fate because he is. You know, you mentioned the Bible, right? That he, maybe Nietzsche is trying to write a Bible here. So he's trying to write. Um, a story of salvation, uh, a well, yeah, narrative of, of of what can give us meaning again. Yeah, I mean, is is the eternal recurrence Nietzsche's answer to heaven and hell? I think it's the. Well, is it saying one of the reasons it seems that 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 life has has lost its meaning is that we? Okay, now I get you. Know, yes, we no longer believe in 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 an afterlife to. To, to 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 give some weight to the actions that we do yeah. when we're alive. Yeah, exactly. They're exactly. I think yes. Putting in, in that. Yeah. If you put it like that, I would agree. Uh, there is no weight to and anything. What the what the eternal occurrence amounts to in in day to day life is that you will live this moment in eternity forever yes. and ever. Yes. So make sure you're you. That's why you should you should you should do what is right. Yes. Uh, and, and not I, do what is right in some moral sense, but do what is right in exactly. a creative sense. And this is why, and this is very difficult to fathom for people, but this is not a thought experiment. Because if it's just a thought experiment, then, you know, you, you can, oh, is this logically possible? Can yeah. I really live every moment? Can I really come back? Oh, no, consciousness, yada, yada. No, that's not what it's about. He tells us to live our lives because in a way that every moment will recur in every moment. Yeah. And it's very interesting when you get into the semantics here, because the German says, ewige Wiederkehr des Gleichen. So das Gleiche is in English the same, but das Gleiche does not mean identical. So there is sameness, Gleichheit is not perfectly identical. Right. And there's a way that Heidegger reads this passage or reads the eternal recurrence of the same that is uh, so on the one hand, Heidegger's reading is very metaphysical. He says that this is necessarily how metaphysics must end up understanding time as it's always understood time just as floating or you know fleeting now states, T1, T2, T3, T4, which is basically what epistemology thinks of it as well. But there's another way that Heidegger reads this, and that's a very beautiful one, uh, which is in his Nietzsche book from the 30s. Where he says that you, if you let Dasein slip into unbravery and tiredness and laziness, then this moment will recur throughout your existence and it will be what it has been. But if you take the next moment and you make it to a greatest, you make it a greatest moment, then this moment will recur as well and it will recur forever and it will have, it will be what it has been. So this is. What all of a sudden, then, if we take this seriously, then life becomes so you know un unbearable on one on the one hand because it's so heavy to take that burden. But then all of a sudden we see meaning again. I think it's really possible to see meaning.
when you take yourself that seriously. Because that's the exact opposite of the ironic stance we are supposed to take. Nothing's real. N nothing really matters. You know, you go out, you search, but then you destroy whatever you find. Nietzsche is saying the opposite. He's saying everything matters. Everything. This is why in that passage in the gay science, he says, think that everything returns. The moon, but also that spider there in, in the corner. So the biggest and the smallest will recur forever. And to live like that, of course, that's, you know, it's a heavy burden, perhaps. But that's the way out for him. Oh, that's, the, that's what the overman has to do. Yeah, to away from the last man. Yeah, it, it, and in that sense, it is a burden, but it's no, more, it's no greater burden than the Christian burden was. What is it? I mean, the Christian, the, the believing Christian um, had to believe that every act redounded in, a, in, a, in eternity. It, it, it made up part of the judgment that would be put on him when he died. So Nietzsche is saying, okay, God is dead, but that, that doesn't excuse you from, from, from living with importance um, and living with, with some consequence. Yeah, yeah, exactly with consequence. That's, that's it exactly. It's, but that consequence, so that consequence is, is pushed into eternity. And with Nietzsche, it's, with Nietzsche, it's pushed into the here and now. Is that, you know, because if you want to take this very far, you could say, okay, if you push it into eternity, then we, we can sell people letters of absolution uh, yes. and, and they can free themselves from this. And for Nietzsche, that is not possible. No. The, the, the eternal recurrence is such that it is now. And by the way, the, the eagle um, and the snake... Uh, that is always with uh, that, that, that are all, who are always with Zeratus, but they, they might symbolize the eternal because of saying that's just uh, a side note. But yeah. um, is the the other great message of the book is I think to be found in section fifty one on passing by, where Nietzsche comes by because I think he was very aware of what his texts could do. And if you, you know, I started reading Nietzsche when I was maybe 16 and you meet other young Nietzsche readers and they become very sort of, you know, on the one hand, quite arrogant towards mm -hmm. our time because it's so easy to say, oh, look at all these idiots. Look, mm -hmm. look at the herd. As Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche sometimes sounds quite resentful and hateful himself. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> sorry. But there is this passage in in Zarathustra, where he goes to the, the great city, but he, not Zarathustra loathes, he doesn't like uh, the city for all of its failures and the last man living there, not wanting to go beyond himself. But there he meets the ape, the Affen, uh, the fool of Zarathustra, who, you know, is, is full of spite and sounds a bit like Zarathustra could sound. You know, when you read it the first time, you could think, oh, this is this is what Zarathustra could sound like. Yeah. And, but then Zarathustra says to, says to himself, he doesn't actually, um, no, he does actually say it to him that this precept, however, I give unto thee in parting, you fool, where one can no longer love there should one pass by. Mm. Thus spoke Zarathustra and passed by the fool and the great city. So I think one of the messages of the book is to, because it also begins with in the very first on the very first page, but that Zarathustra says, "I love human beings," is mm. not to give up on them. No, this is this is nothing if not a joyful book, is it? And yes. there's almost there almost every you know every other sentence and ends in an exclamation point. So the, yeah. this is which is another way that the style um, separates it from these more dr these dry philosophy books that that, that never get read. Um, so so yeah, this is this is a, a joyful and innocent book. He talks a lot about innocence and. Um, how, uh, how one should remain innocent and, and joyful and, and don't get jaded as much as as much as Zarathustra often um, is really disgusted with the, with things around him. Um, he's constantly rebuking himself and uh, and moving from 
from kind of depression to to joy <laughs> to joy and and exhorting others around him to be joyful yes and uh, just to mention this this the, the passing by uh paragraph uh in the German, the verb is vorübergehen, and you can hear the über of the übermensch. So it's really necessary that if you find yourself, I think, so a bit freaked out by, so we say, late, late stage capitalism or modernity, the last man, consumerism, etc., everything that happens. And you've, of course, you know, it, it, whatever process and evolution is at work here uh, has 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 evolved has led has led to people evolving who are perfectly adapting to that system mm. right who who work really well uh in in that environment that we now have if if there's any truth to evolutionary theory and social evolution now but if we are so appalled by that as Zarathustra is and as the fool of Zarathustra is then the response must be to move on, to pass by, and thereby going beyond it, to not to not staying focused on it. Because one of the problems is that if we become antithetical, we, we take the stance of being anti, right? We we are anti-modernity, we are anti-consumerism. We remain fixated on it. We yeah. need it. It becomes our identity is a purely negative identity. Yeah, if all we are is a critic, as we, as we stand against it. <laughs> yes, if all we if all we are is a critic of modernity, right? You know, we could write books about it and everything and, and newspaper articles. Then we need it. Yeah, it, it, it it's it's literally our daily bread. So we cannot pass it by. But the message of the book is to pass it by, because there is something you know, that he sees happening in the breakdown of meaning by the death, in the death of God and that emerges of nihilism. He, there's another passage that I'm not quoting now directly. I have to speak from memory where he says, not just reason, but also its madness is breaking out within us. It is dangerous to be an heir. So that's, a rough translation from from the German in my mind just now, but I think it tells us something. What Nietzsche is see, sees is about to happen is that any, that rationality is always related to irrationality, and that when that when there are moments of breakdown, like societal, economical breakdown, etc., um, those lead to extreme uh, extreme irrational times and that there's something very dangerous about not overcoming our outdated values and and yeah and and and, and running through this is i guess we you know the verb creativity right or to create right that's 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 what's needed and and i i, I talk oh, i've been talking a lot about the ways that um the Nietzsche is 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 doing what religion's doing, but yeah. we all, we all we of course need to talk about how you know Nietzsche, the anti-Christian, right? The ways that his morality, as much as it it tries to replace Christianity, is is different from it. Um, and and I think the the starkest way is that it's a creative morality, isn't it? Individuals, whereas Christian morality is a, is a conforming to a to this to this over overarching rules that have been set down for us and, it, and it's going along with um, what Nietzsche calls the petty virtues the um, the Nietzschean morality is is creative in that it, it's sui generis to, to use that Latin term it's fr it, it must be from the self um, and, and isn't that isn't that what makes it different to the conforming morality of, um, of convention yeah yeah, I think yes, and it's. I think what he wants is is virtue, rather than a morality, because very similarly to uh, just like uh, Hegel, Hegel is very critical of moralität, morality. Hegel wants virtue, because moralität is that kind of you know public display of I'm the good one. Yeah, and, and you know that what Nietzsche has to say about morality in the genealogy of morality, is that morality is a will to power 
it's whoever, and it's very political, right? Whoever uh, possesses the will to, is in charge right now. Whoever has the will to power and power itself controls morality. And virtue is something else. Virtue is something you uh, you you find within yourself, you could say, but also you find by living a life according to the you, you know, let's just say the cosmic law of the eternal recurrence of the same. So this is not this kind of publicly celebrated, this is who we are, and this is you know what is good, and this is what we think is is right or good and evil. But it is this other kind of uh, yeah, tugend of of, virt of virtuousness. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, it's, it's can, it can be confusing to when you're reading this for the last time because he will talk about um, virtues in different ways. There, I mean, there are bad virtues and there are good virtues. He, talk, he talks about the petty virtues yeah. as, as something that that clearly he's referring back to that morality. And it's, I always, I mean, I, I like, he's clearly a critic of morality, but we need to understand what that morality, what sense of morality he's talking about. And he's, he's really talking about a Christian morality, isn't he? Um, I mean, we can talk about morality as a, in a, in a quite general way, as just a, just a code of, a code of living. Um, it, it clearly morality doesn't, has no necessary connection to Christian morality, but the time that he's writing, and of course Nietzsche was, grew up in the churches, both his father and his grandfather were, um, were pastors. Yeah. And, and so, and he's imbued with, with, with Christ, with Christianity and the Bible. So clearly when he, and we have to, and just, just, um, anthropologically, the, the, the morality of that, of Christian Europe, um, in the 19th century was imbued with Christianity. So when he says, when he when he talks against morality, he's not he's not talking against a code of living because I think we can even talk of a, a Nietzschean morality that, that, as I say, replaces Christian morality. But he's talking about this specific, um, specifically Christian morality, and he wants he wants these Nietzschean virtues of creativity to replace the the tepid um, Christian virtues. Of of just uh, of, of of the golden rule of, of doing to others as 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 one would have those do to oneself, and replacing this with, I think we need to talk about um, Ariti, the Greek uh, notion of virtue, which yeah. is which is excellence, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, so uh, just to go to go back to Aristotle, um, he talks about he talks a lot about virtue in the Nicomachean Ethics and for. for for Aristotle, virtue is it's 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 a zoological thing, right? The, a plant has its virtue, yeah. A dog has its virtue, and man has its virtue as well. And yeah, uh, th that virtue is is uh, the moving towards um, what it's the successful completion of that animal. Um, and for man, this is reason and. And and also being political, um, yeah. but but it's it's virtue in in a very. This is before the revaluation of values, isn't it? This is this is virtue in a very plain and simple and, as I say, zoological sense of of simple excellence. Um, mm. it's, it's difficult to talk about any one mm. Nietzsche book without talking about the others, but in, and and then Nietzsche himself said to understand any one of my books, you need to understand all of them, but. Um, in in the in the genealogy of morality, <laughs> morality, the genealogy of morals, as Johannes has said, he he talks about um, the way that this this virtue has become imbued and coloured by this very um, Christian, uh, Judeo Christian sense of um, of spe quite specific values that. They could they go against the the kind of the classical uh, values of excellence? Yes, um, just just on on, on morality uh, on virtue. Then uh, it's you know we we talked about flourishing last time, so that's certainly something that Nietzsche wants because given that 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 God is dead and there's no return to an age where God isn't dead, because as soon as that is possible to say, and and religious life 
becomes so unimportant to most people. It's impossible to go back. We cannot go back in, in time. Yeah. It's so what, what needs to happen is a transvaluation of values, and we don't really know what, what that's supposed to be. We don't need to go into that. But to go back, there is something, you know, broadly Aristotelian, which is rather, you know, what he wants is rather a flourishing mm -hmm. and a self completion, self creation, going beyond oneself, having a greater goal beyond oneself than just, and even just oneself, right? It's, it's not about sort of a, uh, a self, a cult of the self or something. It's finding a greater goal in history. And that's yeah. something maybe that that's, you know, that kind of flourishing rather than becoming the last man, becoming a, a, a flea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is why I mean, that you're saying that as you're saying that this is why Nietzsche is often so hard to read. And but he's appropriately hard to read because modernity is so uh, intertwined with all these things. I mean, on the one hand, you want to say that Nietzsche celebrates the individual, doesn't he? But but on the other hand, individualism yeah. is something that Nietzsche really starkly warns against. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult to be a good Nietzschean, isn't it? It's very difficult because, I mean, for, for Nietzsche to be, you know, brutally honest, is not everyone has a proper self. I mean, this is something he's very clear about, is that is there are people, who, there are human beings who have a self, but the, for the most part, we are just the herd. We are nothing, but we don't have a proper self, most of us. You know, he would probably name Wagner and, and Goethe, and himself amongst those who have a self, but not everyone can have it. Napoleon. Um, sorry? Napoleon. <laughs> yes, I would think so. Yes, certainly Napoleon. Um, and, and, and Nietzsche himself, if I haven't mentioned him. But it's, it's certainly not uh, open to everyone. And there's something, you know, as we're talking more broadly about Nietzsche now anyways, just to finish it up on morality, in the genealogy of morality, also I think one of the first chapters, he does say that morality basically just works uh, sort of a group herd instinct where you call someone else evil, and by calling someone else evil, you are good. And that's a very, as simple as it sounds, is a very profound, I think, insight into the workings of morality up until this day. So it's you you call someone evil you call an entire group evil and therefore i'm the good guy right we can see that happening we don't have to say where it happens but <laughs> it, it happens all over the place yeah um and th that's pretty much how how you know certain mechanisms uh, in society work yeah i, I mean and as as much as again, this is this is this is another complicated complicated part of Nietzsche's thing, Nietzsche's ideas. As much as he see, well, he seems to um, regret the, the transvaluation of values from the from the ancient classical yeah. ideas of excellence to the Judeo Christian um, idea. He he kind of admires them for understanding that this is how you change the world, isn't he? Yeah, and, and he said, and as you said. Uh, he, he he understands that you can't go back, you can't uh, reinstantiate God or um, or go back to that classical idea of excellence and virtue. What we need is another revaluation of values to overcome the last revaluation of values. Yes, and there's something probably not loosely related to that, maybe, which is also in the unpublished. Well, it's it's now published, of course, in German. It's not yet, I think, fully published in English. It might be out very soon, all of his notes. Uh, there's a note from the late 1880s where he talks about, um, and this is something where, where you can really see that Nietzsche sees the future and sees what's about to happen because he's talking about the Fukuyamian ideal of the end of history. He mentions the total, and this is a quote, what is inevitably in store for us today is the total economic management of the earth, where everything will be reduced to a smaller and finer cock wheel in an uncanny, unheimliche, uncanny wheelwork. 
So all that's left for us, that when he says it's inevitably in store for us, there's no way around it. There's, there's nothing that could happen that would make that impossible. He's saying this is what's going to happen. Now, what he's saying is that there will be a, an infinite positive feedback loop where everything is just produced and everyone's ever more finely adapted when you read that through the language of, of Darwinism, of evolutionary theory, then this means that this process will create human beings that are perfectly adapted to do that and are perfectly willing to live that kind of a life where there is nothing beyond them, where everything is really totally managed in a, in a pure economic sense. But the interesting um, thing about that, that note is also how he continues because he then continues by saying that there will be a a type of human being who li can live outside of that economic management and who can actually thrive off what's being produced and create outside of that realm so he does see still that possibility um that there is a certain freedom to escape from it. So can we can we talk a bit about just to to wind things up as just as how we should live as a good a good Nietzschean today? Because as I said, this is modernity is is very complicated, and Nietzsche's um, answer to it is also very complicated. I yeah. mean, as as we've said, one of the one of the one of the great things that Nietzsche calls us to do is be creative. Um, don't really, don't merely submit to the to the to the conventions of morality around us. Well, if we look around us today, there's there's never been there's never been a more creative time in in history. Right? Everyone has their their SoundCloud accounts. Everyone is uh, everyone is podcasting. Every, like us, everyone yeah. is making music on on GarageBand. So what's so would so would do you think Nietzsche would look at would would approve of this or was or is this not quite getting it right? I think that's a very good question, uh, and and it's a very profound question too because on the one hand it just feeds the machine right if if you want to be very uh, pessimistic about everything, then all we're doing is we're giving AI our voice, uh, our voice on all of our data that it requires to feed itself. This is going very much beyond Nietzsche now, I know. Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, you're feeding the machine, right? Because YouTube is nothing but a social media that lives by a continuous content creation. Now, uh, on the other hand, it's true. There is an uh, unprecedented in human history. We are doing this podcast now. We are, I don't know, 200 miles apart at the moment. I, but I could be sitting anywhere. You, you could be... You could be in South America, I could be in China, and we could be doing this podcast that we couldn't have done 20 years ago. And but we, we shouldn't, uh, just to, to be an idiot, we, we shouldn't, um, we, shouldn't uh, we shouldn't use the, the, the achievements of technology to call ourselves achievements, should we? Yeah. No, but I think you, you have to, you know, but with Nietzsche, very interestingly, it's very good you mentioned technology because this just reminded me of something. Nietzsche does call the Übermensch, the Overman, den zur Technik gereiften. That means the Overman is the one who is ripe and ready for technology. Mm -hmm. This is someone who can actually deal with it. So, you know, you know, because what he doesn't want is to say, as in that passage we talked about before in Off Passing By, he doesn't want us to say, oh, this is terrible. Right, the what, are we, what are we doing? That's that's the fool. That's the fool speaking. What he wants is th this is the world as it is. And now go create and go beyond yourself. So probably I think Nietzsche would approve of not everything in terms of content, but in terms of the the creative outburst explosion that's happening. I think he would certainly approve of it. And I think he would also approve of uh, certain institutions coming perhaps to an end all right yeah yeah maybe maybe to just to temper our optimism for a second look to be pessimistic oh, yeah. but on technology maybe maybe Nietzsche would say uh, in his more pessimistic moments something like well technology 
it's not that we've it's not that we're better than we were because we're so creative it's that technology has made it so easy to be creative we, we can be creative without expending any energy without going beyond ourselves uh, i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm not sure i disagree I, i'm not sure i disagree i'm not sure i agree um i think that it makes a lot of things possible that are also very much you know within the the faustian will anyways and nietzsche is a faustian right he wants to have a pact with the devil he wants to know more that's good for him and he wants to go very much beyond himself and i think if we use <coughs> sorry if we use technology just for petty entertainment uh and and consumption then he would not approve of it i think but i think he would approve or maybe i would approve of 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 using technology and over over in using it to liberate ourselves from also because technology is also an enslaving force right um and you can do that by the strongest human capacity that we have and that's our creativity well thank you very much for listening I think next time we'll talk probably about uh, Tolstoy's What is Art, a great essay uh, that we're currently reading. We will learn a lot about aesthetics and a very different perspective on on art, really a very Russian perspective, a very non-European, non-Western perspective. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Well, talk soon.